Hey fellow lab rats, this is Rebecca from the Lab Rat YouTube channel. In this video, I'm going to be discussing liver function testing for our clinical chemistry lecture series. Okay, let's get started. So anatomy and physiology courses are a prerequisite for MLT and MLS programs. Uh, so the anatomy of the liver will not be discussed in depth within this presentation. So the picture on the right hand side shows what the liver looks like and where it is located within the human body. Uh, so recall that the nephron is the basic functional unit of the kidney. The basic functional unit of the liver is the lobule. So the lobule contains hepatocytes, which are epithelial cells in the liver that carry out many functions. Uh, the lobule also contains the hepatic triad, uh, which are the branches of the hepatic portal vein, hepatic artery, and the bile duct system. And lastly, it also has sinusoids, which are spaces in the liver filled with blood. And this is where proteins are synthesized within the liver and can leave uh, that organ and enter the body's circulation. Other than the skin, the liver is the largest organ in the human body. It has a variety of essential functions, including the synthesis or the creation of proteins, amino acids, carbohydrates, and lipids, uh, detoxification of the body, excretion of waste products, and it also serves as a storage organ. Um, it helps to store fat-soluble vitamins, uh, which are vitamin A, vitamin D, vitamin E, and vitamin K. For more on those vitamins, check out my vitamin uh, lecture. Uh, we will talk more about those uh, fat-soluble fat -soluble vitamins as well as uh, water-soluble vitamins in that lecture. Uh, the liver also stores the body's excess iron in the form of ferritin and also copper and glycogen. So remember in the very first lecture on carbohydrates, uh, we talked about glycogen. And glycogen is the storage form of glucose that is stored mainly in the liver and the skeletal muscle. So when there's too much glucose uh, in the blood and the body can't utilize it, it goes and converts it into glycogen and stores it primarily in the liver. Now bilirubin is formed from the breakdown of red blood cells. Red blood cells break down in the spleen, bone marrow, and liver. The porphyrin ring from the breakdown of the hemoglobin of the red blood cell is converted to something called biliverdin. An enzyme called bilirubin reductase then breaks down this biliverdin to bilirubin. And at first, this bilirubin is unconjugated. And when I say unconjugated, this means that it's not bound to anything. Um, also called indirect bilirubin, the unconjugated bilirubin accounts for around 80% of the total bilirubin in the body. So the bilirubin then binds uh, to a transport protein called albumin and is carried in the liver. So it's carried to the liver, forgive me. Uh, once in the liver, an enzyme called ureal diphosphate glucuronotransferase or UDPGT, then conjugates the bilirubin to glucuronic acid. So up, in up until this point, it's unconjugated. Now it's conjugated um, to glucuronic acid. This binding causes, again, this bilirubin to become uh, this conjugated bilirubin, and it's also called direct bilirubin. So the last part of the previous slide was talking about the conjugation of bilirubin. So this conjugated or direct bilirubin is now soluble in water, and because it is soluble in water, it can be filtered by the kidney or secreted into bile and taken to the small intestine. In the small intestine, enzymes from bacteria convert the conjugated bilirubin into something called urobilinogen. Urobilinogen can then be excreted from the body from either uh, in, in either urine or in stool. And it's actually responsible for the brown color of the normal stool. Bilirubin is a common test performed in the clinical laboratory to help assess the body's liver function. It's important to know that the specimens that are being used for the testing of bilirubin uh, must be protected by light. Room light or sunlight can metabolize the bilirubin in the specimen to a different compound. And this uh, metabolism will cause a falsely lower bilirubin level in the sample. So the most common method for bilirubin analysis is a colorimetric method called the Gen Jurassic Groff method. Another colorimetric method used is called the Evelyn Malloy method. 
For newborn babies, a direct spectrophotometric reading can be performed to determine their bilirubin levels. And again, all of these bilirubin tests are performed on a clinical chemistry analyzer and are no longer manually performed within the clinical laboratory. The reference range for total bilirubin for a normal patient is 0.2 to 1.0 milligrams per deciliter. Conjugated or direct bilirubin levels are also able to be measured because they are water soluble and react directly with the bilirubin assay reagent that is used. The normal reference range for conjugated or direct bilirubin levels for a normal patient is 0 to 0.2 milligrams per deciliter. Unconjugated or indirect bilirubin does not react directly with the bilirubin assay reagent because it is not water soluble. The indirect bilirubin level is thereby calculated. So does this remind you of anything? So possibly indirect LDL, right? Remember how in the uh, lipids and lipoproteins lecture, we discussed that LDL cholesterol is usually not directly tested, uh, but the value is, um, uh, estimated, or I shouldn't say estimated, it's calculated from a formula. Uh, the same goes for un unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. It's produced from a calculation, uh, which we will discuss on the next slide. So to recap, bilirubin testing is used to assess the function of the patient's liver. Total bilirubin is measured by the clinical chemistry analyzer. Uh, so total bilirubin is including both the conjugated and unconjugated bilirubin present in the patient's blood. Direct or conjugated bilirubin is also directly measured by the clinical chemistry analyzer. Unconjugated or indirect bilirubin is calculated to produce a result. Uh, the formula is as follows. Uh, total bilirubin equals the direct bilirubin plus the indirect uh, bilirubin. So please check out my other video uh, called Indirect uh, Bilirubin Practice Problems. So I work out some practice problems on how to determine the indirect bilirubin from this formula. And this formula is, of course, something that you need to memorize as an MLT or MLS student. Patients with hyperbilirubinemia have an increased bilirubin level in their blood. An increase of bilirubin uh, in the blood causes something called jaundice or icterus. So this is a yellowish discoloration of the patient's skin, mucous membranes, and the eye sclera, which is the white of their the white of portion of their eyeball. Patients with elevated levels of bilirubin may also have an abnormal looking tint to their plasma or serum. Normal serum or plasma has a straw-like coloration to it, and patients that have an icteric sample or teric sample have a darker yellow or even greenish tint and can also be like a brownish tint to their serum or plasma. So if you see in this photo on this particular slide, the normal white part of this patient's eyes have a yellowish tint to them as well as on the skin. So this is somebody that is experiencing jaundice. Now, there are three categories of jaundice, and they are prehepatic jaundice, hepatic jaundice, and post-hepatic jaundice. So we'll discuss these categories here just in a moment. Just before we talk about the three categories of jaundice, I just wanted to show you this really quickly here. So the sample in the left-hand photo is a normal patient sample. Um, so let me get my little pointer out here. Let's use red. So you see how this serum is like a straw color yellow. So this is a normal sample. Now the patient on the right-hand side of the sample, this is a picture that I actually took. This kind of it so this is a mild icteric sample um it's kind of like a darker yellow color um, again this is kind of a mild example of it there are some patients that have severe jaundice that have almost darkish green hints uh, to their serum or plasma but this is what we call an icteric sample so back to those categories of jaundice so again there's three categories Patients with prehepatic jaundice will have a mild increase of total bilirubin, usually up to about five milligrams per deciliter. They will experience an increase of unconjugated or indirect bilirubin. Uh, there are two main causes of prehepatic jaundice, an excessive destruction of red blood cells and an ineffective production of red blood cells. Patients can have her, uh, hereditary reasons for an abnormal destruction of red blood cells, um, including spherocytosis, sickle cell disease, thalassemia, and hemoglobin C's disease. 
So these are uh, red blood cell disorders that will be discussed in more detail in uh, hematology. Patients can also have an abnormal destruction of red blood cells due to an acquired issue, um, such as hemolytic disease of the newborn and various anemias, including autoimmune hemolysis and hemolysis induced by medication. Megaloblastic anemia due to a deficiency of nutrients, including folate and vitamin B12, sideroblastic anemias and lead poisoning can lead to ineffective erythropoiesis, so that's an ineffective production of red blood cells uh, that ultimately causes prehepatic jaundice. Uh, remember an important part here. In prehepatic jaundice, the liver is healthy. It is prehepatic, so pre-liver. So the liver is okay in this type of jaundice. So in, I mentioned a couple of different disorders on the last slide here. So spherocytosis is an inherited disorder that causes the red blood cells to be spheres instead of a bioconcave shape due to an abnormal membrane. So this photo on the right hand slide here shows a peripheral blood cell differential that has spherocytes on them. And you'll learn all about these in hematology. Let me just put it on my pointer here. So this is a spherocyte. Um, so this, these are normal red blood cells kind of around it. And you notice how there is no central pallor, which is uh, this like white part. So this is the central pallor of a red blood cell, but this cell doesn't have any of that. And also it's smaller. So uh, you'll learn again, you'll learn more about this in hematology, but uh, spherocytes are microcytic and hyperchromic, meaning uh, microcytic, meaning they're smaller than normal red blood cells and hyperchromic, meaning they have um, less central uh, pallor than normal red blood cells. So high MCHC, again, hematology stuff. Um, so uh, thalassemia is another disease that results in abnormal globin chains and hemoglobin and causes the patient to be anemic. Hemoglobin C disease is yet another disorder and it causes an abnormal type of hemoglobin to form, resulting in hemoglobin C crystals. And these are denoted in the below photo um, on a red blood cell differential. So this is a hemoglobin C crystal, again, hematology. Uh, just as, as a note, if you have already had hematology or talked about these before, look at all these cells here. Do you remember what these are called? These are target cells or codocytes, right? So this is a hemoglobin C crystal, but these other cells are uh, red blood cells that are abnormal, um, that are called car uh, codocytes or target cells. <laughs> Uh, now, hemolytic disease of the newborn, um, so this occurs in newborns when blood types of the newborn and the mother are incompatible with each other. And in short, the mother's antibodies attack the antigens on the baby's red blood cells, uh, causing them to lice. So all these disorders can be causes of prehepatic jaundice. Um, and again, you'll learn all about these in hematology and specifically hemolytic disease of the newborn will be talked uh, quite a bit in uh, immunohematology or blood banking courses. Now, hepatic jaundice is the only form of jaundice in which the liver is impaired. Patients with this form of jaundice have a moderate increase in total bilirubin, so up to 30 milligrams per deciliter, and both unconjugated and conjugated bilirubin is increased. There are many reasons a patient may be experiencing hepatic jaundice, so uh, Kernicterus, krigler najjar syndrome, and Dubin-Johnson syndrome are some examples. Uh, Kernicterus occurs in neonates, uh, so this happens when a, a neonate has a deficiency of UDPGT, which creates uh, a buildup of unconjugated bilirubin in the brain tissue. Uh, in patients with krigler najjar syndrome, uh, bilirubin cannot be conjugated because they have no UDPGT. Uh, Dubin-Johnson syndrome prevents conjugated bilirubin from being excreted in the liver. Um, and then in addition to these specific syndromes, uh, patients with damage to the liver from either hepatitis or cirrhosis can also experience hepatic jaundice. Patients that have post-hepatic jaundice have an extremely elevated total bilirubin level, so up to 60 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, because the patient's liver is functioning normally in post-hepatic jaundice, bilirubin is uh, able to be conjugated. So a biliary obstruction due to stones, tumors, or strictures in the bile ducts prevent the conjugated bilirubin from being excreted into the small intestine. So this leads to a high uh, increase of conjugated bilirubin in the blood. 
So recall that urobilinogen is created by uh, the conjugated bilirubin being broken down to bacteria, I'm sorry, broken down by bacteria in the small intestine. And if this urobilinogen cannot be created due to this, uh, this obstruction, the patient will not have any in their feces, leading to a chalky white colored stool. So if a patient is um, has white stool, uh, it's very likely that they have a, an obstruction. So remember in the last lecture on the kidney, and we talked about nitrogenous weights. So those are urea, uric acid, creatinine, and ammonia. And we just briefly mentioned ammonia in that lecture. So now we're going to talk uh, more about it. So ammonia can come from a variety of sources, including the breakdown of amino acids and the breakdown of urea in the liver and in intestines. There are minor sources of ammonia from the kidney as well. Specimens that are being tested for ammonia must be collected on ice and run immediately. So increased blood ammonia is seen in two main disorders, hepatic encephalopathy and Reyes syndrome. So hepatic encephalopathy occurs when a patient has liver disease. Uh, blood is unable to pass through the liver in high enough amounts in order to detoxify that ammonia within the blood. Uh, so due to that increase, uh, of ammonia in the blood, uh, patients can experience uh, neurological problems, including uh, going into a coma. Uh, Reyes syndrome occurs usually after a viral infection in children, especially if the child has been treated with aspirin. So they experience an increase in blood ammonia as well as vomiting, delirium, and even coma. Um, so uh, for those of you that have children, or if you just recall just in general, um, young children should not be given aspirin. That's why uh, aspirin is not recommended for children is because of this uh, possible syndrome. So a liver function test panel or hepatic panel usually includes bilirubin, AST, ALT, and ALP. AST, ALT, and ALP were discussed in my enzymes and cardiac marker lecture. Uh, GGT, which was also discussed in, in that enzyme and cardiac marker lecture, uh, can also be used to assess liver function. So those are what we call the liver function testing, testing um, menus. So in addition to these liver function tests, other tests including total protein, albumin, lipids, and coagulation tests can also be run to help assess the liver synthesizing capabilities. Hepatitis is an inflammation of the liver that can be caused by a virus, bacterial infection, autoimmune diseases, drugs, or even parasites. So in terms of testing, the majority of hepatitis cases seen in the clinical laboratory are those caused by viruses. The most common viruses that cause hepatitis are hepatitis A, B, C, D, and E. Cytomegalovirus or CMV and Epstein-Barr virus or EBV can also cause inflammation of the liver. The hepatitis infections that are caused by viruses are what we are going to be focusing on in this lecture. There are two different routes of transmission of the viruses, the oral fecal route and also the bloodborne route. So when the disease spreads through the fecal oral route, it means that contaminated feces from an infected person are somehow ingested by another person. So this is caused by improper hand washing or improper sanitization uh, procedures. For bloodborne transmission to occur, contact with infected human blood and other potentially infectious body fluids must occur. So this includes through sexual content, contact, uh, accidental needle sticks, or sharing of needles. So hepatitis A and hepatitis E are spread through the oral fecal route, whereas hepatitis B, hepatitis C, and hepatitis D are transmitted via the bloodborne route. There are currently uh, vaccines available for both hepatitis A and hepatitis B. Uh, for laboratory testing, amino assays, blood assays, and polymerase chain reactions or PCR tests can be performed for their detection. Hepatitis A, or HAV, is acquired from the fecal oral route. This means that a patient must come in contact with feces infected with the virus in either food or water. HAV is usually short term with uh, symptoms uh, as a mild fever and just general fatigue. Because HAV spreads via the fecal oral route, the virus can be avoided by proper hand washing and clean water sources. 
And like I said in the last slide, there is also an HAV vaccine currently available. Hepatitis B or HBV is a chronic infection of the liver that can be mild or severe. HBV is the most common of the viral hepatitis infections in the United States. It's transmitted through blood or blood products and can lead to cancer of the liver, liver failure, and cirrhosis of the liver. There is a vaccine available for HBV and it's usually required uh, in the United States to be a healthcare worker. Now, diagnosing a patient for HBV requires the testing of antigens and antibodies. Hepatitis B surface antigen, or HBSAG, is the first antigen to rise when a patient develops an HBV infection. HBSAG is a marker used to determine an initial and active stage of HBV infection. Hepatitis B antigen, or HBEAG, is the second antigen to rise after infection. The first antibody to rise is the core antibody or anti-HBC. So previously we were talking about antigens, now we're talking about antibodies. So anti-HBE antibody develops after exposure to the HBEAG antigen. Now the last antibody to rise is the antibody to the surface antigen and it's called anti-HBS. So anti-HBC, anti-HBE, and anti-HBS remain elevated in HBV patients for a long time. Patients who have been vaccinated will have, uh, so a vaccine to the hepatitis B virus uh, will just have a positive anti-HBS antibody when tested. Hepatitis C or HCV is a serious and chronic hepatitis infection that is bloodborne. Patients can become infected with HCV through illegal drug injections, blood transfusions, sexual encounters, and exposure to blood in their occupation. Unfortunately, there is currently not a vaccine to prevent hepatitis C virus. Hepatitis D or HDV is another viral hepatitis infection. Around 5% of patients with HBV, so hepatitis B virus, are also infected with HDV or hepatitis D virus. HDV is diagnosed by the detection of antibodies to the antigen HDAG. Hepatitis E or HEV is a viral hepatitis that is transmitted through the fecal oral route. It is commonly associated in countries with drinking water contaminated with feces. All right, so that concludes this lecture. If you liked this video, go ahead and give it a like. And also please remember to subscribe to my channel for more educational laboratory content. And as always, if you have any questions about this specific lecture or have any um, suggestions on uh, other lectures or other topics that you would like me to cover, please feel free to, to leave your comments in the comment section below. Until next time.